infrastructure that we have got and the technology that is available to all of us. I believe that uh, the lawyers don't have to literally come here and be physically present. All the business can be carried on without actual physical presence here. And if actual physical presence takes place, it will be welcome. And I suggest that the bar of this country must now carry on a great struggle with Parliament, change the Advocates Act, recognize foreign qualifications from foreign universities as sufficient for enrollment in the Indian bar, but that also is not necessary. You, uh, I don't believe that foreign lawyers are coming here to appear in our courts and argue cases. What they will probably do is that have local partners, local lawyers in cooperation, and they will be the persons who will be actually doing the job. These lawyers, I assure you, will bring to you new kind of work to which you are not used so far and it will bring you sources of income which you will appreciate when it actually happens. Be sure that the change is not going to be a reduction of your economic resources in this country and on the contrary you will be able to get much more money than you ever had seen before. And after all, India is poor. The, the fees which are charged by lawyers here do not compare, do not compare with fees which are being charged in England, for example. I had recently, in some case connected with India, I wanted an opinion on a matter, uh, on an issue which arises in that matter, the issue of what should happen to a convict whose conviction is certainly influenced by adverse press publicity. So I, I asked some British lady lawyer there, a very leading lawyer, to give me an opinion, an opinion which I had myself drafted, but we wanted one opinion from some foreign lawyer and one opinion from a retired judge of the International Court. And you'd be amazed that when I got the bill, I was aghast. I got a bill of 23,000 pounds for a mere draft opinion. But if, if that's the kind of money that the foreign lawyers will bring to you, I think you will be very, very happy uh, that, that you have changed your mind about the objectives of this organization. What kind of work will they be doing mainly? Surely not appearing in the district court or, or, or appearing in the magistrate's court and doing original side work, they will not. They will probably be doing dealing in opinions. They will probably be doing drafting work. And maybe, maybe the most important part of their work will be that they will be attaining to international arbitrations in which the provision of the arbitration agreement is that the sittings will take place in India and then they are compulsorily to come here and appear in those matters. And, and it will be a great pleasure, I assure you, and you will learn so much, particularly the youth juniors of the Indian Bar are likely to profit from it under any circumstances. And I suggest one thing. Ultimately, let us, let us be a little... Uh, I mean, little understanding of our own limitations. What does an ordinary LLB student who has just passed his LLB examination, how much of his legal knowledge is there? It is not as if our Indian universities and our law schools are so superior to those which exist in these foreign countries <coughs> that, uh, uh, that we must ignore the degrees which are granted and obtained by our own students, for example. Some of them have gone to the best universities, got the best kind of uh, degrees from those colleges and they are much cleverer than any graduates that we produce here in our own colleges. And yet, when, you, when they come for enrollment, they are told, no, that this degree is not recognized. 
for God's sake, change this kind of an attitude, which is just self-importance, which does not really deserve to control our conduct. And I regret that uh, the Supreme Court is not helping at all in this matter, and we must move the Supreme Court for an early decision of these matters, so that uh, we should do something about it. And my friends, it is, it is very, very necessary today in the modern world that those civilizations which are not subject to any or governed by the irrational religious impulse that has taken charge of many, many, many cultures here. And I hope that we will find a great improvement when we sit with these kind of cultures, coexist with them and learn lessons from them. And that will also be a lesson to those persons who belong to the kind of culture which believes in irrational behavior, irrational behavior based upon ancient scriptures which have no meaning today in the modern world and should have no influence whatsoever on the rational conduct of anybody. And I suggest that our lawyer friends themselves should read a wonderful book that has recently come in, Religion Gone Astray. Please make that a textbook in every law school. A book which is written by three scholars. And the three scholars are, one is a Jewish rabbi, the second is a Christian pastor, and the third is a Muslim imam. And each of these great three scholars have been able to show how every religion has parts which are totally disposable and those parts which are of eternal value and universal value. In other words, every religion has a core and every religion has something which ought to be discarded as times and people's changes, people's minds change and people's education changes. It's a great book to read and believe you me, believe you me, that book is the book which explains the constitution of India's emphasis on secularism. Our secularism is our greatest achievement greatest achievement and this secular society of ours will develop if we are in contact with people from other civilizations which also believe in secularism and have put religion in its proper place. So I suggest that you are on the right lines, you are doing a great job, but please, please argue with the reluctant sections of the Indian bar which do not accept this kind of a principle and this kind of a advice that at least I have been giving all along, even in my writings I have been saying, that do not oppose this unity of legal cultures from more than one country. Let them come here and be sure that you can be at a great distance and yet partnerships will work. One partner can sit here, another partner can sit in San Francisco and you, you can handle the job with your, with your instruments that are available today. So my friends, I am very happy that I am here. I, I told you that I am not a great expert in these kind of things. But if some assistance is necessary in our courts, I will certainly be available to you to further this great call of yours. And I'm I'm very really happy that you called me here and my, my great, shall I say, gratitude to you for allowing me an opportunity to meet all of you. And thank you so much. Now I'm sure this was something insightful session uh, by Mr. Ramjit Malani. 
about opening the barriers for uh, the legal industry for all over the geographies. Now, after hearing the most renowned lawyer of our India, Mr. Ramjeet Manali, let me present you the rising star of the legal firmament, Dr. Surat Singh. Dr. Surat Singh is Harvard and Oxford educated top lawyer of India. He practices at Supreme Court of India and Delhi High Court. He is also an international lawyer. He was educated at Delhi, Oxford and Harvard with his three master's degree in law from Delhi. Oxford and Howard and his doctor of laws from Howard. He is arguably the highest educated lawyer of India. Incidentally, he happens to be contemporary of American President Barack Obama at Howard Law School during 1988 to 90. After his seven years stint at Oxford and Howard, Dr. Sura Singh returned to India and started his law career in 1992 with the Attorney General of India, G. Ramaswamy. Dr. Singh, a uh, list of professional achievement is long. To date, Dr. Singh has successfully handled complex legal cases involving land and real estate properties valuing more than US dollar 50 billion for state and federal government, top corporate houses and government corporations. Dr. Surat Singh and Associates, areas of expertise are constitutional issues, land acquisition law, property and real estate cases, high value cases where government, whether central government or state government have treated any individuals, organization, corporate unfairly. I'd like to tell you what are the honors and the various awards that uh, the, Dr. Shura Singh has received. He is the Pride of India Award 2011, which is Bharat Gaurav Award 2011. He has been the, uh, for the Indian American Friends Group, group along with the Chief Justice of India. He has also received the International Peace Award 2011. He is also the International Educator for World Peace. He has been the Social Scientist of the Year 1999. And he, is the national, he has received the award for the National Environmental Science Academy, that is NESA. And he is the Eminent Jurist Award 1997. Uh, by then, I'd like, also like to tell you that he is uh, the Delhi Chief Minister, Shri Sahib Singh Verma, in uh, April 97. Uh, he has received the award from him. He is also the pro president for the Harvard Club of India. And he is also, he was also the secretary for uh, the Oxford Cambridge Society of India. And he has been recently appointed Chairman Center for Law and Good Governance, Shobit University, India. Like, congrats, congratulate Dr. Surat Singh for that. And now I'll, make, I'll uh, request Dr. Surat Singh to take it forward and uh, speak on the top. The most esteemed and legendary legal luminary of our time, Mr. Ramdev Madani, uh, Mr. Pankaj Varnami, excellent organizer of events, my distinguished friends, like Dheeraj, I cannot call you good morning in 21 languages, but at least I can say namaste. I can say, of course, good morning both in Oxonian accent as well as American accent. <laughs> so, well, first of all, the great news is that today, my friend, Finance Minister Arun J. Lee has announced that the tax system in India, which some people also call retrogressive tax, or uh, tax terrorism, he says he will appoint a high level committee to look, look into the whole matter and to make the tax law certain, predictable and fair. So now the atmosphere is here where things are changing to make India an investor friendly uh, country. Now coming to the Foreign law firms in India, first of all, I will divide it into three parts. One, the context. Second, what are the laws existing at the moment, though Mr. Ramjeet Malani has briefly touched on those. And third, what can be done? So the context. Now we are in India. And what is India? What is the rhetoric and reality about India? Well, India is one of the most paradoxical country, full of contradictions, where no matter what theory you come out with, you can prove it. If you think India is rich, you have enough evidence to prove that. If you think India is poor, 
you will collect enough evidence to prove that as 